She's joining us for our encounter today. Go little boo. She's just had a nice cooling hose off inside. But it's a very hot day, so it's important that we try and keep both Burma and Angela as cool as possible throughout the day. So that generally means lots of hosing off, a bit of play in the pool. Of course, spending some time in the shade. And also encourage them to have a play in all the different substrates. So we've got the mulch here, sand pile over by you guys in the grandstand, and some nice piles of dirt down the back as well. Angela's hanging out inside. Um, she just had a little bit of a training session out the back, and so she's going to hang out and enjoy some tasty food since she did so well. While Emma is working with Burma out here. Now it's important for these guys to have a little bit of uh, space from each other and um, a bit of time with that sort of one-on focus and, and um, on their own. So hey, boo, good girl. And so we like to make sure we give them that opportunity at different times throughout the day. Um, and sometimes more than others, it really depends. For these guys living with each other 24-7, and Angela's been with us five and a half years now, it is important for them, but also they let us know when they need that. There's quite a lot of uh, goes on with the dynamics of these two, uh, more so because of Angela's hormonal estrus cycle. Um, and so there are times where they really don't want to be anywhere near each other and times where they don't want to leave each other. So we just work around that and make... Um, make Make it work, and of course, whatever um, suits them is best for them. <laughs> so, with Bumi, she's going to be doing a few different behaviours um, throughout her session. We like to try and keep it different, but of course, we also want you guys to be able to see some of the things that we do on a regular basis to make sure that we can check them over and that they are staying nice and healthy. So, those are husbandry behaviours. And of course, these guys also have a huge range of natural behaviours. So, natural behaviours are things that they would be naturally doing. Um, as elephants, either in the wild or wherever, so it's about encouraging a lot of those behaviours as well. And so at the moment for Burma, some stretching is really important before she gets up to too much, especially lots of walking and climbing. I um, mean, that's because at 38, she's technically, I guess you'd say on the lighter scale of middle age for an elephant, they tend to live between 50 to 70. Angelie's a fair bit younger at just 14. And she's still got a little bit of sort of growing to do as well. But for Burma, that stretching is important. We want to make sure that those muscles are warmed up and that those joints are freed up and um, basically able to give her the best opportunity to have fun and, and manoeuvre her body around without hurting herself. Just like we stretch before we exercise, it's exactly the same for these guys. And because Angela is only 14, she is very playful, she's full of beans. Burma does like to join in with that play, so we want to give her that best opportunity to feel really good. Um, and that allows her to run around and have a good time. Wow. And then, of course, um, after that, or sometimes before, it really sort of varies. She also gets a massage most days of the week. So, again, that massage can, 
and help her feel better, which encourages her to play more. Um, but we're going to act as a bit of a recovery after she has had a really big play. Angeli tends to do a lot of running back and forth around the paddock. Burma will give a pretty good effort for about 50% of that, and then she'll just stand around and wait for Angeli to come back. So it's quite um, a funny sight to see. So that stretching you can see with the front joints and those front legs, people tend to think elephants um, being so big, and Burma here is just over three tonne, that they tend to be quite slow movers and not very good at moving around. But these guys are actually extremely agile, very flexible in their movements, and they're great at climbing up and down all sorts of different terrain. Because for Asian elephants especially, that's where they tend to live, quite mountainous regions. So they need to be very sure-footed, and they need to be able to make their way up different kind of um, slopes and mountain hills, down again, and even crossing things like rivers and streams on a regular basis. Now when they are moving around, um, often in the thick jungle, they do come across objects that tend to get in their way. If you do have a herd um, which has sort of various generations in it, from your grandmothers right down to your young babies, um, and sometimes with a well-worn tasking, it covered as trees come down. So with Boomer Moves logs around here, you can kind of picture what it might look like with a, a tree trunk falling down, landing through one of their well-worn paths and baby elephants unable to climb over those tree trunks so you probably saw Burma can manoeuvre over. So well, quite often what they'll do is they can move those out the way to make, make a path um, for the younger animals of the herd if they need it. And that's just a natural problem solving that comes in with the intelligence that um, elephants have. They are uh, very social animals, very tactile and a great intelligence and, and problem solving skill um, really built in there. So they are pretty amazing. So it's interesting to see how she manages when she can feel the weight of the log for Burma um, and she'll pay attention to that movement and um, how it's going to affect her body um, and all of those she takes into consideration as she moves them around. Now playing with the logs is probably one of Burma's favourite things to do. Quite often she finds uh, a good fun log to play with around at night and she'll rest it on her back and spin around and lay down with it. Um, and Angelie's starting to get into that as well. So trying to provide all sorts of different objects for them to interact with and make sure that they're really utilising all the different things in their environment here from the pool and the sand and the mud um, to the rocks which Angelie loves climbing and the logs um, that Burma really enjoys as well. She's quite particular about some of her logs. She does quite like to balance them in, um, in orders and you'll see when they ask her to do something very specific she really puts a lot of effort into it. So that log there that she's pushing really isn't very um, heavy at all. It's quite a small log, I guess, if you look at some of the larger ones in here. The biggest log we have uh, is set over that, that far side towards that grandstand. That's weighing over a couple of tonnes. And even some of these ones, like the one in front of me here, is deceiving. It's actually about a tonne and a half in weight. So with her three tonnes, she can push over her body weight. Um, and with like, a bit of effort, she doesn't have to put that much effort in. They've got incredibly powerful bodies. And if you look at the size of the head, really strong neck and shoulder muscles. So they need to be able to carry the weight of that skull. Um, and of course, that whole head there. Be able to lift it up as she does. She's like, stepping up at the moment. She can stand up on some of the logs to get even higher. And when they eat, they get to be feet from right under the canopy. You can see the way her trunks go all the way up the air, adding to her height. And she needs those strong muscles to be able to hold that up in that position while she reaches and grabs at that food. Now that trunk is, of course, her nose. It's pretty amazing. You can see it go all the way up there, adding another metre or so higher above her. And then she stands again, like I said, on a higher log. It might be a metre tall. That's going to get her even higher into the canopy. So they do reach from right up high and force graze along the ground as well. They can be pretty destructive when it comes to eating and because they eat so much they get through about 120 to 150 kilos of food every day and because we like to feed as close to a natural diet as possible that means tons and tons of vegetation so all sorts of different types of trees from banana palm and sugar cane to palm trees, uh, willow, puka, Morton Bay figs and of course a loads of different species of bamboo as well which is a really good natural um, diet for them. So they'll do a lot of breaking up using that trunk and their feet to break it uh, down and soften the food as they eat it but they will actually munch on large tree trunks as well so you might have seen a few branches around and um, enjoying some palm trunk just before. Now I think Emma's going to have a look at her mouth in just a minute. You might have had a, a quick glance there. 
all that food, of course, is going from that trunk of it, like we use our arms and hands of grabbing food, uh, to put into our mouth. So she does the same thing using her trunk, places it in there, and she's got some lovely big teeth in there to do all that chewing and grinding to break down that food for digestion. So Burma has four teeth in her mouth, two on the top and two on the bottom. They are very big molars. Uh, they get larger as they grow because they go through six sets of teeth. So as they get bigger and they need more food, the teeth accommodate that. So at 14, Angela's teeth are still relatively small. Burma's here about the same size as a house brick um, and weigh about a kilo each as well. With a really big um, sort of root base through into her gum. A little bit more stretching there for her. It's a, an amazing way you can see the way she can manoeuvre her body and stretching all those different muscles. Okay. Now you might be able to see as she does lift her trunk up, it leads into that upper lip and um, on either side of there we have her tussulca. So this is where we, um, Asian female elephants grow their tushes. So the tusha is a smaller undeveloped version of a tusk, which of course elephants are pretty well known for. You will find the male Asian elephants growing the large tusk and both male and female of the African species. But again, it does come down to genetics um, and that genetic pool of if there are tuskers breeding to continue on that genetic trait of the elephant. Um, probably something that's been quite well known for a long time and has affected elephant populations. Not as much these days, but definitely a lot in the past is the poaching of ivory, which is, of course, those tusks. So when you start um, eliminating, I guess you could say, the, those um, genetic lines, because to take an elephant's ivory, they don't give it up for free. Um, the poachers have to kill the elephant to get it. So when, if they aren't able to breed um, because they are being killed by poachers, then you're getting a lot of the, the non-tuskers breeding, and you might end up with a complete generation of elephants that don't grow any tusks or tushes. So they are like us in the way they've got um, all individual traits and genetics that come through their DNA. Um, as they have been bred into sort of, kind of like a family tree, you could say. And that skill there of using her foot as well to balance and manipulate it, and also using that powerful jaw. Um, she can often put the logs right up into there, that gives her an extra bit of strength or grip. Let me get that one, Boo, that one's a bit awkward, I think it's stuck under another log, it's got bendy. You can use that jaw to, to grab it. So again, another, I guess, another great use, and that amazing nose as well, the way it can curl around, it's got no bones in it, it's made up completely of muscles, um, but the strength that she has and, and the ability to be able to twist and turn it, manoeuvre it, and the strength is pretty amazing. Now the only thing that does go through the nose is like ours, it's air, she has two nostrils, just like us, but she can suck water up into her nose, which I obviously don't recommend for us, and she'll blast that back into her mouth, and that's often how they drink. Berm and Angela are a bit lucky here, of course they've got hoses, they quite often like to just grab the hose, pop that in their mouth and have a good drink. Because then the wild they wouldn't naturally come across water sources that often, these guys tend to drink a large amount, but not very often. So you might see some of your domestic um, animals go to your water bowl and drink fairly regularly. So these guys, they might only drink uh, once every couple of hours, but when they do, they will drink um, tens and tens of litres. So in her truck, as it stands at the moment, Burma probably holds around nine to ten litres at each drink. She may fill up that trunk three or four times, if not more, and then do the same a couple of hours later. They also have this amazing ability to store some water further down their throat in a pouch. So on those really hot days, if there's no water around but they need to help cool their body down, she can reach her trunk down into her throat, suck up that water and blast it across her body. So they are pretty amazing with all the adaptations they have to the environment around them. Now because they can't actually sweat, they do rely on that environment, so like cooling herself down that way, spending time in the shade, and you'll probably also see as she's moving around, she gets hot, those ears will start to flap. Now for these guys, they have very thick skin covering their body, but the area uh, at its thinnest is on those ears, so you might see as she comes past the chin that um, veins, uh, arteries and capillaries all visual on the back of those ears, especially once they're really nice and hot and the blood is pumping. So flapping those ears like that is going to help pull, uh, pull the blood that goes through the ears. That then transfers around your body, helps control your temperature. And of course, if you think about us fanning ourselves, creates a nice breeze and a bit of coolness against your body as well. Now we've been very uh, lucky to have Burma here as an advocate for her species uh, for a number of years. She's actually celebrating her 30th anniversary at the zoo this year, and time, I guess, has definitely flown for those of you who have visited her over the years. Uh, you may have seen in the news recently that we will be saying goodbye to both Burma and Angelie in the coming year. 
Queen to lead at 14, that is very important for her to be able to have the chance um, to, I guess, keep her reproductive health uh, as best as possible, which means through breeding, um, or at least having that opportunity to. So the AI procedures we've had here, uh, although a little bit of a logistical nightmare, um, we have been able to go through a few. Unfortunately, a few um, hypersensitivities of her that were only found out quite recently has meant that they haven't been successful. So what we're wanting to do for her in the future is get her the chance to be able to breed naturally. Now, uh, you may not know, but Vermin and Tilly are the only elephants in our entire country. Um, so that means there are no bull elephants for her to breed with here, so she will need to be travelling overseas to do that. Now for Verma, it's important for her to also be part of a herd and a multi-generational herd. Um, and as we're unable to sort of secure that future and, and bring that herd to her any longer as was originally hoped for and planned, um, it is important for them both to travel to be uh, part of a new herd and, and have a really good future. Because as I said before, they do have a long lifespan. And I think for them to have the opportunity to be around young animals, um, calves, etc., is going to be really important for them. Yeah. As you can imagine, for us, I've been with them for a number of years. It's a pretty heartbreaking time. But knowing that um, we can do the best for them over the next little while and really make sure that their journey is as safe as possible for them, and uh, with this, I guess the least amount of stress is our ultimate goal. And of course, we will be spending time with them in their new home until we know that they're completely settled um, and going to be okay for the future. So the best thing you guys can do to honour them is to continue to come and see us, um, pop in and make sure you get your chance to say goodbye. Uh, they will be here for at least uh, probably another six months or so at this stage. We haven't yet confirmed where they will be going. Um, but once we do know their new home, then we will be, of course, sharing it with all of you. So you may not know, but can do come in to visit us. You are actually helping out Asian elephants like Berman and Angeli in the wild. We have a number of projects we support. Um, mostly focused in Sri Lanka, which is Angeli's homeland. And that's also because they have the largest population of wild elephants of the Asian variety left anywhere in the world. Um, they also share the island of um, Sri Lanka, which is relatively small, with over 22 million people. So they have a really high rate of what's called human elephant conflict. Um, and that's basically just the term given because both humans and elephants are coming into contact every year and that is resulting in the deaths of both of them. And so what we're really trying to do is make a difference through researching. So we support radio collaring of wild elephants and those researchers are doing amazing work really understanding the elephants, what their needs are and then advising the government the best way to look after them in the future. And also working with the children of the next generation, letting them understand how important it is for elephants in any kind of ecosystem where they're naturally found, uh, not only for their own uh, safety and future, but actually the huge range of wildlife that share that ecosystem rely on elephants being there for their own survival. So they really are a pretty amazing species um, that's needed out there um, and long into the future. But I'm going to wrap it up there, guys. We're just going to play a little bit longer. Um, feel free to stick around and enjoy them, but of course don't forget we do have other encounters we're out the zoo. And of course we've got some pretty amazing wildlife as well. So please enjoy the sunshine, uh, make the most of your day, and hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Thank you.